Hey, everybody. This is Benjamin Boyce. I have another discussion with Megan Murphy, who is a Vancouverite and feminist, uh, author and founder of Feminist Current. Dot com in this interview. Well, it's not really an interview because we've had several discussions now. We just kind of we're in the groove. This time we talk about her lawsuit against Twitter. Twitter banned her, which had a you know a drastic negative effect on her business as an independent journalist and as a writer. And we talk about the parameters of that suit and what she hopes to get out of that suit, which isn't necessarily monetary gain. She's trying to get Twitter to reckon with the user base. We also get more into um, her stance on pornography, sex work. Uh, we talk about different forms of feminism, the kinds of feminism that she dislikes, the kind of feminism that I am wary of, and the kind of feminism that she puts front and center. We also kind of challenge the Me Too movement. We get into a lot of nuanced discussion. And for that, we might entertain or just piss off everybody, left, right, and center. But I don't know. We're cool people, at least Megan is. And uh, we have a cool rep RT. So let's just jump right in. Here's Megan Murphy. I mean, I think that Twitter messed up with me because if, you know, for example, if they had waited until they had actually established these new rules mm. around misgendering or dead naming, surely I would have broken those rules. Mm. Or maybe, you know, maybe I would have, you know, been more careful about pronouns on Twitter or something like that. Um, but because of the way they went around it, I mean, or went about it, they broke their own rules, right? Because, they, mm. I mean, the main thing with me is that I was kicked off for this one tweet about this individual we were talking about earlier. Um, and that tweet was posted and I was kicked off before Twitter had made public Oh yeah. that they were changing these rules to ban so-called misgendering and dead naming. I mean, the, the rule, I don't even think that that rule would have applied to me in that case anyway, if they had established that rule beforehand, because this individual goes by his male name on Twitter and in other places online. So yeah. I don't see how anyone's supposed to, know what their pronoun is mm. um and so but yeah so their twitter in their terms of service says that they're supposed to give users 30 days notice if they're going to change the rules and they didn't give anyone 30 days notice and they never even let anybody like it wasn't twitter that announced that they had these new rules it was first reported hmm. by um like it started being reported in the media the first report in the media happened hmm. 20 minutes after I was suspended. So it wasn't like huh. a press release from Twitter or anything like that. It was a report, I think, in Pink News, huh. which is like a oh, really? kind of your They're pretty news. intense. Yeah. Yeah. So they and yeah, literally 20 minutes after I was banned. So I was banned at like or I got my suspension notice at 1040 p.m. on a Friday night and at 11 p.m., there was this report published about Twitter now having these rules about banning misgendering and dead naming. Yeah. So there's that. And, uh, and the fact that in their terms of service, Twitter also said that, you know, you can't ban they, or they promised they wouldn't ban users retroactively. So they wouldn't create a new rule and then go back and start mm. applying that rule, um, and they to, did with to you. suspend people. And that's exactly what they did with me. Mm. They went and found old tweets. Hmm. So, I mean, they, I, I mean, I don't really think they have a leg to stand on. I mean, obviously, they can kind of, I suppose they can just argue that they're allowed to do whatever they want. Yeah. But they Eventually. certainly can't justify banning me. And the things, you know, I'm not sure if you listened to that interview with Jack Dorsey and Sam Harris on Sam Harris's podcast. No. So Sam Harris interviewed Jack Dorsey okay. on his podcast and he brought me up. So he asked Jack, you know, oh. what about this um, Canadian journalist who got banned for saying men aren't women? Hmm. That isn't actually literally why I got banned. I did get locked out for that tweet and was made to delete it. But yeah. I wasn't banned at that point. Um, and Jack Dorsey was, of course, like very vague and hmm. <laughs> like didn't say anything specific. And who knew if he probably doesn't really know yeah. why I got kicked off specifically. I'm sure it was just some employee or a few employees who didn't like me or were getting complaints about me and were like, man, let's just get rid of her. Um, and uh, he said, well, you know, like we, 
we don't usually ban people for one tweet. We like look into to background behavior and basically it's contextualized. Mm-hmm. So we look for behaviors like these are his words, look for behaviors like doxing um, mm-hmm. people who have created multiple accounts in order to harass a specific person yeah. Or people who are, you know, threatening or posting violent threats. So, uh, you know, I've done none of those things. <laughs> you haven't doxed oh, and, anybody, even just no. A I've bit? never doxed anyone. <laughs> Not even a little I've bit. Ne- no, I only had my one account. I wasn't like on Twitter all day and multiple accounts, like <laughs> bugging people. I mean, people have done that to me. Like, ironically, it's like yeah. there's totally been people like that who they their one hmm. account gets like shut down eventually because they're harassing or threatening and then they have another account that pops up and they start harassing again and then I block them like I don't you know I don't even yeah I would just like block these accounts and then they would start another one and you know like over and over and over and it's like okay well how are these people getting away with it but um yeah I mean I've not I've not done any of those things like so 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 your case is that they're not following their own rules but how did how did you getting kicked off affect you how has it well, affected you? I mean, it's my job. Yeah. Like, it's like, like, it's, I mean, I don't think, I think it's wrong that Twitter is banning anyone for ideological reasons or political reasons. I certainly think that it's wrong that all these people are, you know, like, it's not just me who's been banned over this so-called misgendering or dead naming rule, you know, like lots of people are getting kicked off. But I think, you know, as far as I know, I'm the only person person who's like like I'm an independent writer and a journalist like this is my job like this is how I make a living this is how I'm able to have a platform this is how I'm able to communicate with the public this is how I'm able to promote my work and yeah. like you know things like events that we're putting on or talks that I'm doing like I have no means to promote any of that stuff and to reach an audience like it's like it's yeah. really an attempt to shut down my ability to work and communicate and speak and to make a living like it has a huge I mean imagine it's not you know it's not all about money of course it's about free speech and and communication and politics and all sorts of things but at the same time it's like imagine how many more uh, you know patrons I'd have on my Patreon account if I still had a Twitter account. And I'm Mm -hmm. sure that whoever was reporting me or however that went down, I still don't know. I can only speculate. That's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to take away my livelihood and, you know, stop me from having a job and a platform because Mm -hmm. it was very difficult to shut me down before because most people Mm -hmm. can get fired from a job or, you know, banned from a publication but I yeah. had my own publication so yeah. it was sort of impossible to do that to me you know and and our and feminist current relies solely on donations mm-hmm. so it was really just a readership and it was my audience that was supporting me and that's why I'm able to work and speak is because I have so much support from an audience that I've and a readership and yeah, that you know, cultivated. Like a yeah. movement that, yeah, like that I've cultivated over years and years and mm-hmm. years. So it really is like an attack on, on my livelihood as so well. So how, how is, um, how is Twitter susceptible to being uh, sued then? Is there like a, what, what's the technical terms? I, we don't have to get to contract this. really. And you know, kind of false advertising. Okay. Right. There's a few, I mean, there's, we're suing them on the basis of three things, two of which is like legalese that I can't even remember, but the main thing is breach of contract. And the other one essentially amounts to dishonesty, like, yeah. you know, false advertising in terms of what they stood for. Right. Because yeah. they, they claim and what they were providing over and yeah. over. Yeah. Right. The service that they are providing, why they exist, what yeah. they are offering users. So users are signing up because they think they're signing up for, Uh, a platform that's going to allow them to communicate freely and to communicate with and hold accountable people in positions of power. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, how many users would sign up to use a platform that was explicit in saying that those users would be banned for political reasons or Mm -hmm. ideological reasons or just arbitrarily because Twitter's friends don't like them. In what way was there much less enthusiastic about that? I'm sure. In what way was there a breach of contract? Like, how did you sign a contract with Twitter? 
And and I ask this because I assume then that we're all we have all somehow signed a contract with Twitter. Yeah. So you agree to their terms of service when you sign up. But they don't agree so, to their own terms of service. Or yeah. Do, and so the what I what I, the points that I mentioned earlier around the giving thirty days notice if they're going to change the rules and not applying. Okay rules retroactively. So it's those two things that are the main things in terms of that breach of contract issue and what we all sign on to as users when we sign up for a Twitter account. Okay. But we aren't paying for this service. So can't they just say it doesn't matter what you do because you're using our platform? We don't need you? Sure, they could. Um, but I mean, it's sort it's not honest to pretend that Twitter is just like any private mm. business at this point. It's mm. not like, oh, it's a restaurant that you can't go to. Okay. Um, but, you know, at the same time, like uh, if a restaurant was not allowing people in for, I don't know, like restaurants aren't allowed to not let you come because you're black. Like restaurants aren't allowed to discriminate in that way either. Yeah. But it's different. It's like you can go to a different restaurant, right? But but like, if you're let, let's just do hypothetical. If you're rude to other customers in the restaurant, they have the right to kick you out. Sure, if you're abusive. But I mean, hmm. I mean, my larger point is that like Twitter isn't like a restaurant. It's not like a private business. They can claim okay. to be, or other people can say that, but it's not true. Everyone knows that Twitter is now the public square. Like mm. it is about democracy at this point. And this mm. is where we get all of our information. This is where news is shared. Mm -hmm. This is how we, this is where public debates happen. Um, you know, the New York Times reports on tweets. They're like, I don't think that you can really exist as a journalist mm. okay. without being on Twitter. I don't think you can exist as a politician without being on Twitter. And I believe mm. Twitter has even acknowledged that, you know, like you can't really really participate as a public figure mm. without being on Twitter, unless you're like a huge, massive celebrity, maybe you just wouldn't need to bother at that yeah. point because you're so big time. Who yeah. cares? But, but your uh, fame would have carried over from pre Twitter days. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's not, it, it's not honest to pretend as though, Twitter is just some private business and that we can go somewhere else because we can't go. So like, wh what else is like Twitter? Facebook doesn't function like Twitter, you know, like commentary yeah. doesn't travel in the same way. And yeah. you can't communicate with people freely on Facebook because people have their own pages. And yeah, um, it just doesn't it doesn't yeah. function in the same way. You can't make announcements um, that that travel as far yeah. as they would on Twitter if you were, for example, saying, you know, mm. this is my opinion on this or like this is an event that I'm having or this is some like important commentary that I have to say about this issue. Do you guys think and you by you guys, I mean, you and your your lawyer, your team, do you think that um, regardless of damages that you might receive, do you think you guys have a strong enough case to actually force Twitter to recognize their responsibility to the user base? Do you think that there's a chance that you guys can force the hand of Twitter into reckoning with, with the service they provide? And the yeah, totally. I mean, I think we have a really strong case and my lawyers think we have a really strong case too, otherwise they wouldn't have taken it on. So my mm -hmm. lawyers are getting paid only through what I can fundraise. I'm not, oh, okay. paying, I'm not paying for this because I can't, I don't have, you know, it would cost yeah. tens of thousands of dollars. I don't have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. So they agreed to take it on based, you know, they're just going to take whatever I can fundraise. So it's all being funded through donations and they took it on because they think that it's an important case, but because it's a strong case, I mean, none of us are likely to make any real money off of this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it might, it might set precedent. It might be something that that changes the conversation or the direction in which this internet company is going. Yeah, that would be the purpose to ch to set precedents. Like, uh, I mean, obviously, I want my Twitter account back. Do you think you'll be able to get that back? Is that I don't know. Something I have no you guys idea. Are actively fighting for. Yeah, we've asked for okay. my Twitter account back, and we've asked for Twitter to give the accounts back to mm. other users who've been yeah. banned on the okay. same basis, and in, in a way that's unfair. Yeah. Um, because like I said, I mean, there's, there's lots of other people who've also been banned mm -hmm. for seemingly kind of like, like ridiculous reasons, yeah, you there's know, a lot of nothing, ridiculousity, yeah. yeah, like nothing offensive, nothing mm -hmm. hateful, nothing violent, nothing threatening, just sort of, you know, 
you know, criticizing the idea of gender identity or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. calling a male who identifies as a trans woman, he, mm -hmm. um, but nothing that could possibly constitute harassment or anything like that. I want to ask you a hard question. Okay. I but first that I, I want to answer ask, it. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm not good with the hard questions, but, um, could you, could you move your phone off of the desk though? So it doesn't vibrate the microphone. Oh, sorry. That's fine. My text. Um, okay, so this isn't coming from me, but this is something I, I wonder about because we've done uh, several interviews now. I guess two, maybe three. I think two, though. Um, two. And a, a few commenters, and they're just random YouTube people, say that basically you getting I banned... I stop touching my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when you touch your hair. You haven't Sorry been doing it at all. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt and make a joke in the middle of your hard question. No, I... Uh, yeah, I, 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 I noticed a lot of commenters are like, stop touching your hair. Well, some commenters have pointed out that... that Feminist Current has banned users, has deleted comments yeah. um, because because people have been asking questions or they've been rude. Has your stance on how you guys moderate your website changed in the light of you being banned from Twitter? I mean, I let people comment on the site who disagree all the time, but if they're continually disagreeing in a disingenuous way mm. or just, I mean, it's called trolling, right? It's like, okay. People get banned for trolling. People get banned for being assholes, for being disingenuous, for being unproductive. And I how mean, do you how the, do you identify the difference between a troll and a gadfly? How do you how do you be able, uh, somebody who's actually just really testing you? How do you how do you know whether or not somebody's being genuous well, somebody, or disingenuous? Well, if somebody's challenging you in good faith and they're actually responding to your arguments and mm. actually responding to what you're saying, and they're not just lying over and over and over again, like they're not just um, you know, not listening to what you're saying and kind of repeating themselves over and over again or um, misrepresenting what you're saying in order to keep coming back with the same bullshit. I mean, yeah, like I, it is a tough one because it's like I would prefer not to delete any comments or ban anybody, but the comment section would be psycho. Mm. And the point of the comment section is on my side anyway, is to have a productive conversation. Mm. And there's some like if you're leaving like 30 comments a day and it's the same shit over and over, it's like, fuck off. You're just okay. wasting people's time like you're you're just taking up a bunch of space and it's going to irritate all the other regular commenters who are ha trying to have a productive conversation yeah. to the point where they're going to stop commenting because they're like, oh, every time I leave a comment, this guy is like, mm -hmm, like, yeah. you know, just being stupid and yeah. just kind of doesn't really give a shit like you can you can sort of tell i mean i've been moderating this comment section now for you know since 2012 or something like that and you can tell i think when people are being sincere or not hmm. um and you can tell when somebody's really curious or is trying to challenge people in an honest way and those people totally can stay on the site and you know, my regular commenters and readers have gotten mad at me and annoyed at me lots and lots and lots of times because they think that I'm letting mm. men say offensive things on the site, what, you know, they perceive to be offensive. Um, people who are challenging ideas around rape culture or challenging ideas that we hold around pornography and prostitution mm. and all sorts of things. And, you know, I've had regular commenters leave because they're so yeah. annoyed at me for letting these men stay on the site. So I do. It's not about disagreement. I know that lots of people online will say like, oh, I got banned because I disagreed with you. And it's like nobody gets banned for disagreeing. You get banned for acting like an asshole or being disingenuous. All right. I, I'm glad. Um, yeah. Thanks for letting me ask that question. I wanted I wanted to give you an opportunity to actually address that, because that's one thing that I thought was interesting. And I wanted to hear your your thoughts on yeah and most people actually don't get banned i just start deleting their comments again it's like if you're leaving like 20 or 30 comments at a time it's like no you can't do that just leave a few like intelligent thoughtful comments don't just like leave like a barrage of comments saying the same thing over and over again every day like i don't know then i'm just gonna start deleting your <laughs> your stuff like well speaking of speaking of comments how is youtube uh how's the youtube community um been for you it's been really good, actually, which is surprising because I thought it was going to be awful hmm. um, because I feel like YouTube doesn't like feminists very much. Um, and 
you know, and I didn't know what kind of audience I would have on YouTube because I don't know who's on YouTube and I haven't participated on YouTube for the most part ever. You know, I never really yeah. watched you. Like I've started to a lot more lately because I'm there and because I'm finding people on YouTube that I find interesting, but I just never really paid that much attention before, to be honest. So I didn't know if I was going to end up with a bunch of people who were like, fuck you, whore. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's like comments like that, too. But for the most part, like people have been supportive. And I also really appreciate that people are sort of letting me explore different topics. What do you mean? Because I was sort of, well, I was worried that if I started talking to people who weren't necessarily feminist hmm. or talking about issues that challenged feminist ideas in any way that people would feel disappointed in me or feel betrayed by me or yeah. feel like I was kind of selling out or whatever and I mean it's not that it's not that my, the interviews I've been doing have been anti-feminist they just haven't been feminist and they've they've I've interviewed people who do challenge kind of feminist mantras and accepted feminist ideas um you know around things like me too and due process and those kinds of things um do you think that the feminism is uh has gotten kind of insular do you think that there's an echo chamber that um you're consciously or unconsciously trying to dissolve or, or make more porous totally i mean it's the hypocrisy that i see did you hear that facebook noise no or did that okay good i was like should i shut facebook down okay I am very popular, as you can tell. <laughs> you are so popular. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> like, um, uh, like, in the same way that I feel frustrated about hypocrisy on the left, I've become quite frustrated with hypocrisy that I see in feminism. All right. And what's one of the bigger hypocrisies? Well, the free that you want to work against. Okay. You know, this thing where we're mad that our speech is getting shut down, but we oppose the free speech of people that we disagree with. Hmm. You know, and it's not not all feminists believe that, but certainly there's lots of feminists that I'm allied with who do think that it's an acceptable position to take to say we want our free speech but no, I don't support free speech for all. I don't support the free speech of these people because I think hmm. that they're politically dangerous. How, or, do you, how do we tell whether or not an activist, and, and let's just take a feminist, for example, how do we tell the difference between a feminist that's going towards equality uh, versus a, a feminist that, that just basically wants a reversal of the patriarchy and, and wants the reversal of power? And is that like just a, a man fantasy or a fantasy, a negative fantasy of feminism? Of feminism? Do you think that there are uh, individuals in, in the movement that that want to reverse the power structure? Or I don't think that it's true in general. As far as like the feminists that I'm connected to, yeah. in any case, I don't think I I think that's largely false. That idea okay. that what we want is to be in power and you guys to not be in power for so for men to be subordinate and for women to be in power I, that's not the kind of politics that i've ever been involved hmm. in or the kind of politics that actually real life women that i really know are advocating for like maybe there's commenters online or people on tumblr or whatever saying yeah. all sorts of shit like yeah. castrate all men kill all men blah 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 blah. but nobody in real life says that you know the women that i really work with women who've been working in the movement, women who work in transition houses, women who've been fighting prostitution, women who've been fighting pornography. I shouldn't say nobody, but for the most part, those are not, that's not a common thing to hear. Yeah. Um, I, I asked that because, um, cause I, I was just, I'm thinking about you and, and another feminist uh, named Anita Sarkeesian. Um, and, yeah. uh, she, she does g gaming stuff. And for some reason, like, you know, just, me and Anita Sarkeesian used to be friendly until I took on this trans issue and then she fucking oh, okay. ditched me. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to throw shade at her. I just like on a personal level, I just, I get along with you, but like there's something about her that I just, I can't accept. And, and I, I'm not like angry against her, but there's just something about what she's doing 
that that's off to me. Whereas what you're doing when you focus on women's issues, it just seems like there, there's more room for me to like either agree or disagree with you. And it seems like you're not going into, it seems like Anita kind of is going into male spaces and trying to change it. Whereas you're, you're more concerned with, with the female spaces and, and with the, with the, you know, the female rights and stuff like that. I, and I'm just, I'm throwing that out there cause that's what I was just thinking about, like different kinds of feminism and, and different ways that it's perceived either justly or, or unjustly as, as kind of being problematic or. I mean, I haven't, I haven't really followed what Anita is doing very closely in a few years at least. So I'm not sure I can speak to that. Um, Sorry, my dog's whining, so I'm just going to bring her here. Come here. Okay, this is oh. Emma. <laughs> sure. <laughs> if you can stop her from whining, yeah. Um, well, I, I didn't mean to like. I didn't, I didn't mean to like target Anita. I don't want to do that. I want to participate in that. I just. I was just wondering about like different kind of strategies of feminism, different kind of goals of feminism. And I will uh, say that, like, I feel lately. And, and I like, again, like I'm so wary of ending up sounding like I'm turning into some like weird, like MRA right winger or something like that. Do you, do you have a gun but... behind you? <laughs> no, I've never even touched a gun in my life. This is Canada. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I don't, I think. I feel like a lot of liberal feminism is kind of stupid and I feel like the kind of anti, I mean, I've always felt that liberal feminism is kind of stupid, but for different reasons, but I feel like the kind of virtue signally show offy anti man stuff is quite boring. Hmm. And I think a lot of feminists, liberal feminists engage in that kind of thing where it's like, Oh man, you know how men are and mansplaining and, mm. and man, the series, you know, kill all men, white men like that, the, the whole yeah. New York times, why it's okay to hate why uh, why it's okay to hate men. And all men are such like whiny babies and they need to stop complaining and they have nothing to complain about. And that even to, you know, like I got in a little bit of trouble, not as much trouble as I thought I would be for hmm. as, and, uh, like as far as being accused of essentially saying, well, what about the men when I was talking to mm. Megan Dom on YouTube? Yeah. Um, because, you know, like I do just because men are in positions of power in our society in particular ways doesn't mean that men don't struggle and don't have problems and that we shouldn't consider them also and that we shouldn't have any concern at all we were talking about me too mm -hmm. and so I was sort of asking and this has been something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is I was like well what is it that we want to come from me too and I'm not talking about you know serial predators or violent or abusive men like people like Harvey Weinstein um, or people like R. Kelly um, or people like Bill Cosby who just were predatorial for mm. years and years and years and are, were really seriously abusive to a lot of girls and women mm. women and that was just a pattern for them and they were in these positions of power and they took advantage but you know men who sort of engaged in bad sexual behavior at some point in their lives often when they're quite a bit younger and then were me too'd and then mm. have sort of just been ostracized and I was like well where Mm. where do we go with this like how do they come back and what is it that we're trying to achieve by doing that you know what when do these guys get to be accountable and you know come back and sort of say okay I understand why this behavior was wrong and like do they get to join regular society or do they just are they ostracized forever and they can't work ever again and they can't have friends ever again and they can't hang out and they can't be accountable like because I would assume that what we want is for these men to be accountable and for us to have a conversation hmm. that leads to some kind of understanding about hmm. what you know why is this woman pissed at you like what did you do that made her feel pissed you don't feel like you did anything wrong. She feels like you did something wrong. So something yeah. happened in the, between there. And again, like these guys who weren't necessarily, you know, who weren't violent or weren't like, it, it's hard to talk about like the range of abuse because okay. abuse is 
complicated, you know, like hmm. I, I've, I mean, I've mentioned before, like or I've mentioned lots of times, like I was in an abusive relationship, but so much of that abuse wasn't really physical. Like there was physical stuff that happened, but abuse, a lot of what happens in terms of abuse and abusive relationships is psychological and emotional and verbal. Um, and how do we, how do we uh, correct that or how do we hold somebody accountable? to that yeah and and you know how do we I just I mean and again I think that's something that I kind of used to advocate for more which is just like fuck them but you can't really just say fuck them about all these guys because it's a lot of men who've done shitty things in sexual relationships with women not a lot of men that necessarily have raped but men who've behaved badly Mm. and unethically and who've hurt women and who women feel wronged or even traumatized by and we're just going to ban them all or we're going to try to is that is that the push just to ban everybody that violates well it seems like that's happened a little bit and you know it's sort of like i you know like i wonder even i mean how does what do we do with somebody like louis ck he's not allowed back forever he's not allowed to do comedy forever he's not allowed to you know I don't know. Well, I, I, I guess in a certain respect, it's not so much that people want him gone forever, but they just want to reserve the right to get completely irate whenever he does show up. I think people just are really getting off on being irate. There's like a there's a section of society that's really into that. Um, and that should not that has nothing to do with justice at all. Uh, and that's exactly well that's what i'm wondering and i don't i mean people can get irate as much as they want that's fine but uh, yeah it's sort of like i wonder what the purpose is i wonder what we want to happen or we just want to be able to yeah be angry and talk shit and pontificate online i think i mean i think it does seem like some people want him to not be allowed to do comedy ever again and i don't know is that a fair punishment. I'm I sure don't some think you can would stop argue him. that it is, but <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> no, I suppose not. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be hard for him to get a TV show again in any case. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, he won't be as successful as he, as he potentially uh, was. Which, I mean, I don't want to focus so much on Louis CK because he's yeah. probably not the best example. And he but is. You, you said you, you got in a little bit of trouble like, for saying, what about this men or trying to enter into the conversation? Cause you know, like I kind of, you know, there's some men who, I don't think are horrible men who've done bad things. And I don't think that it should have to be either or like Hmm. you behaved badly when you were 18 and and you Hmm. should be accountable for that, but that doesn't make you evil. And it doesn't mean that you should have to leave society forever and never come back necessarily. Okay. You are like a horrible asshole. I don't know. And I mean, the due process thing is something that we aren't allowed to talk about in feminism and anybody who says the words really? due process is no. I mean, I remember trying to have conversations around, you probably won't have followed this story, but there was a story here in Vancouver around this guy, Stephen Galloway. Did you follow that at all? I don't think so. No. There's a piece on Quillette by Brad Cran that's, that addresses that story. Um, if you want to look it up, But I remember just trying to talk about that story because I didn't understand what had happened. So I was like not prepared. I was not prepared to take a position on the story because I didn't know what happened and nobody would tell me what happened. You know, like, and (laughs) I was like, well, I can't, like, I can't say this guy is a horrible guy or that he's an abusive Mm. guy or that he's a rapist if I don't know what he's done and nobody will tell me what he's done. And I'm not saying he's not a horrible guy or a rapist or abusive because I have no idea. But there was a sense that the narrative had already been set, that the judgment had already come down and there's no reason to look at what. Yeah, you were supposed to take a side and if you're a feminist, you're supposed to take the the right side and and to ask questions about it kind of made you not a a hmm. pure feminist weird and that's what i don't want you know like i want to i want to know i i don't want to have to take positions without having evidence yeah and well, what would... without i want to be able to have nuanced conversations about things and i don't want to have to just hmm. believe what everyone says because everyone's saying it and that's what i'm supposed to believe and that's the position that i'm supposed to take i want to be able hmm. to think independently and critically 
Um, and I think that we can totally support women and victims and also still do that. Mm -hmm. What would a, what would a feminist form of forgiveness look like to you toward, toward a man, toward a man that that violates, um, I mean, it's a tough question, but I don't, I mean, I don't know that forgiveness is that important. I don't know. Like I would never Mm. suggest to any woman that she needs to forgive somebody. I'm never going to forgive my abuser. I think he's a hmm. sociopath. Okay. Like, so that's interesting. Like, that's like a, well, on a societal level, it's a level, hard though. thing for anybody else to say. Cause for me, I know him and I experience that. And it's sort of like, so I know who he is and I know that he's never going to change. And I know that everything he says is going to be bullshit. Hmm. You know, like he's not somebody who's ever going to be accountable, but that doesn't mean that I think that every man who's done something wrong is incapable of accountability. Well, yeah, um, but, but with that particular situation, do you forgiveness isn't just about like excusing the other person. It's about letting go of your negative feelings towards them. Right. I mean, do you, do you carry around your anger and, and doesn't that anger, wouldn't that anchor anchor you to the trauma in a way? And, sure. Maybe, but I just, I wouldn't, I just wouldn't want to tell anybody to how they should feel. Okay. Because, and you know, for me, it's like, I felt really angry for a lot of years and now I don't feel angry anymore. Sometimes that just takes time. Like it's the same, it's similar to like, I mean, any sort of traumatic experience or bad experience that I've had or even, you know, breakups and stuff like that, you feel really angry for a while and eventually you just get over it and you're fine and maybe Hmm. you're not mad about, mad at them anymore or maybe you just don't care or whatever. And I mean, some of that I think has to do with maturity and sort of, being maybe more comfortable with yourself and knowing yourself better and <sighs> yeah but this the, that's that's the individual thing what about this curdled form of justice that takes the form of anger by proxy i'm anger i'm angry on behalf of the victim and that's why like with with louis louis ck right people are anger angry on behalf of of his victims, uh, depending on how victimized the victims were. Right. And so when we talk about forgiveness, uh, I'm talking about specifically like crowd forgiveness. How do we crowdsource forgiveness? How do, how do women as a group deal with men as a group and violators of women in, in a way that, that can actually go forward and move forward and, and restore, uh, allow for restoration of that man into society? It's such a tough question because, I mean, I've been really critical of restorative justice because I think, for example, because I think that's offered as a solution, restorative justice as opposed to criminalization. Um, Mm -hmm. Because I think that it can work, but I think that it can also just allow abusers to manipulate and continue to lie and continue to gaslight and it sort of Mm. gives them an opportunity to continue doing that and then the victim ends up feeling like there's been no justice served Mm. um and so it's hard to say like okay well i can tell this man is sincere and this man isn't sincere i mean part of the reason that i bring up louis ck is because when he was uh called out on his behavior which i do think was an abuse of power um and was wrong and he wrote that letter and I thought that that letter was a good example of somebody being accountable hmm. and hmm. and sort of dealing with being called out in a non-defensive way. He didn't try to defend himself. He said, you know, what I did was wrong and I'm going to step back and stop talking and let you guys talk. And so I did think that it was sincere hmm. and I think that it demonstrated accountability and I think that, you know, like... I, I, my assessment of it was that it wasn't just fake and virtue signaling. I mean, that's, to me, that's like the most annoying thing in the world, like is fucking fake people. Like I can't stand it. I cannot stand (laughs) virtue signaling. I can't, like I value, I want people to be authentic. I want them to be themselves. I want them to be as honest as they possibly can be. We're of course not honest all the time, but, um, you know, like don't be fake. Like, don't like you I I can see through douchebaggery so easily I think (laughs) like and uh I think that he was being sincere so I sort of was like okay you know this is a good example and we're still raking him through the coals so what do we want 
Is there a we though that we can control, or is it not like isn't crowd justice just the loudest people with the pointedest? Pitch sure, and they're all virtue signaling their anger. Not all of them. Some of them might be justifiably angry, but I think there's some things that if we're angry about, will get a lot of traction. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, if I if I voice anger about this p- particular thing, I'm going to get lots of likes and retweets, and I'm going to yeah. feel good about myself, and that's what I can't stand. And that's what I see from all these like armchair progressives online who are like posting on Facebook, on Twitter, like, God, I hate racists. And it's like, Oh, how brave of you to say so. (laughs) Well, is there a way to save the me too human being you are? Is there a way to save the me too movement from voices like that, from disingenuous uh, virtue signaling um, people like that? No, probably not, because this is what liberals do. They virtue signal. <laughs> do I sound like Ben Shapiro now? <laughs> you know, I just spoke with a detransition like female. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, talk about a wet t-shirt contest. We'll just uh, get the liberals crying and then uh, see what happens. But <laughs> um, I was talking to a detransitioned uh, young woman who uh, experienced rapid gender onset rapid onset gender dysphoria and she said that she's a rat radical feminist and she made a uh, a difference between liberal feminists and radical feminists and radical feminists want liberation liberal feminists want equality but when you say liberal feminists or liberals you're talking about a different group of people you're not opposing I mean, them to the radical um, I, would, I mean i would define radical feminism versus liberal feminism in that way, sort of broadly, like, you know, radical feminism gets at the root and tries to address systems and Hmm. uh, liberal feminists sort of try to change uh, things on the surface. Okay. Um, So yeah, they might be liberal feminists would be interested in equal pay more than radical feminists would be. I don't think radical feminists really talk about things like equal pay very much. Um, hmm. you know, like, uh, so sort of more policy legislative issues okay. that, you know, ensure that there's 50% women and 50% men in engineering or something like that. That would be a liberal or a radical? Liberal. That would be a liberal thing. Okay. So they want the stats. Yeah. And, and radical feminism would be more about like targeting areas where women are being, uh, abused in some way such as uh, through sex industry or yeah so we've focused a lot obviously on yeah porn and prostitution mm-hmm. and you know and so and why why these things are happening you know like why is it that why is it that the sex industry exists and what's mm-hmm. actually happening in the sex industry and why and why are men treating like women like this in the sex industry why are men okay with having sex with like exploited, abused, mm. marginalized women and girls. So many men around the world. Mm. Not all men, but a lot of men. I mean, the sex industry is a huge industry and there's a lot of women who are being abused and exploited and who are really marginalized women who have come from poverty and abuse and have just cycled back into that and that men seem to have no qualms about hmm. buying and using in that way. Have you seen Vancouver, um, the sex industry in Vancouver change for the better in, in the last 20 years or since you've been aware of it? No, it's awful. Um, I mean, the, I think it's probably grown, if everything. I mean, we have hmm. massage parlors that are, you know, hmm. the, the women in those massage parlors are often trafficked um hmm. and are largely asian women this is really it's a really oh. racialized industry huh. um and you know indigenous women are overrepresented in the sex trade in vancouver and there is like there was a kitty stroll and now child prostitution mostly exists indoors so in apartment buildings and sros and things like that but prosti- there's a huge prostitution industry in vancouver and since, you know, we, we changed the laws in Canada to make it illegal to buy sex, it's still legal to sell sex. So prostituted women and girls can't be criminalized, but men who pay for sex should be criminalized, but are, you know, very progressive, 
leftist hmm. mayor just decided he didn't want to enforce those rules. So the cops are doing nothing about it. Hmm. And you don't think, uh, you think that cutting off men's access to porn at the same time that you cut off their access to uh, pornography or uh, prostitution, what's going to happen with all that energy? Like, like, is it something that we can fix on a societal well, level? Well, I'm not or cutting it... off men's access to porn. How would I do that? <laughs> well, I mean, like you're against <laughs> porn. Like, do you, so you're saying that. Yeah, but like, I'm trying to you... explain to men why porn is bad. I mean, okay. I'm not making porn illegal or banning porn. Of course, okay. I would like porn not to exist. I don't, to be honest, I don't have a legal solution to porn. I don't know what to do about porn. Mm. I mean, I'd like to make it less profitable because obviously porn like the mainstream porn industry exists because it's profitable and men are making a lot of money off of it mm -hmm. um as well as of course men's demand and interested in watching interest in watching pornography but what i try to do is just to make people think about it it's like what are you watching what is this teaching you what messages mm -hmm. are being sent via these images like do you mm. think this is good for women? Do you think this is good for you? Do you think this is good for your sex life? Do you think this encourages empathy and like mm. egalitarian, respectful relationships between men and women? Because it doesn't. Mm. Most of it doesn't. I mean, everyone's always going to come back and say, oh, like not all porn's bad. Like I'm not watching like gangbangs all the time or like the extreme violence. But like most porn is misogynistic and most porn like porn is like there's so much racism in porn like any you know like you're watching images mm. of like women doing things that they're obviously not enjoying and you're like and the guy's calling her a whore like mm. and a bitch and a slut like that's it's not positive so how do you how do we how do we make uh that demand so your 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 solution or your tactic is to bring awareness to the uh to the psychological implications of this or the sociological implications of this behavior or consuming this sort of media because you can't stop the media from being produced or consumed but you can slow down the consumption or... yeah i mean that's i'm sure that i you know like i'm still working on solutions like i'm still trying to think about what an effective solution would be um and mm. but yeah for me as far as my work has gone it's always been to sort of try to explain why this isn't just neutral. It's not just sex. Mm. It's not just a fantasy. Like it has real life impacts on mm. real people, not mm. just the women who are in porn, who are maybe being hurt or, you know, like they're doing something because they need the money. And then that, that imagery is going to stay online for the rest of their lives and they can't mm. do anything about it. Um, but like how, how is that impacting the women in your life? How is that impacting your relationships? How is that impacting the way that you look at women and engage with women and have sex with women? How is that impacting you and your dick? Like, how is that impacting? Like, because it's not, you know, like, it's not, it's not good for men either. Mm -hmm. Like, porn isn't good for men. What does porn do that's good for men? Uh, stress relief is one answer to that. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not against masturbation. I'm not saying like stop masturbating or stop fantasizing. Well, so not everybody's got like a fabulous imagination like you do. Like they, they need to. They need. To... I don't know. I don't think I have a fabulous imagination. I'm sure I'm quite dull. But <laughs> and I can't like I can't pretend I know what it's like to be a man. Mm -hmm. I'm not a man. I don't have a man's brain. I don't have a man's body. I don't have the same sexual urges that maybe a man does. But at the same time, like... You're looking at a man right now, aren't you? <laughs> you just looked off camera at a man. Did you not? No, I didn't. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> like, as if I would be doing this interview in front of, like, my boyfriend and being like... <laughs> 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 so what's the response then generally and and how have you how have you uh developed you think in in your case against porn like what's the response and and how have you developed well i know that for, on a personal level like the amount of men who told me that i've changed their perspective on porn is notable on a broad scale probably mm -hmm. not you know the men who've said that to me are probably like 
you know, five or ten men. I suspect hmm. there's more. I know there's a lot of men who read Feminist Current who've emailed me and said that I changed their perspective on hmm. pornography. Hmm. Um, but there's, you know, women and men who've e- emailed me and told me I've changed their perspective on prostitution. Hmm. So I think that I think hmm. that it can have an impact. Um, and I think that if we challenge the normalization of pornography on mm. a broad scale culturally, then that would have an impact, you know, like what do you mean domin- by challenging that? The dominant yeah. narrative is that pornography is harmless. Everyone does it. It's just sex. It's just a fantasy. It doesn't matter. And okay. also we shouldn't talk about it because we don't get a say in people's private lives, but pre- well, you know, pornography isn't private. This is something that's up for public consumption. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is imagery that, is impacting everyone like you can't there's no person like you can't get away with not watching porn anymore Hmm. you know like even if you don't seek out porn you see porn online it's everywhere Hmm. and people are just told over and over and over and over again that it's normal and harmless and Hmm. i think that that's the conversation that we need to change we need to talk about yeah that imagery and what impact it has and i feel yeah I, i i just feel really troubled by the idea that, mm. and this is probably where I end up getting accused of being like uptight or a prude or something like that, but like I feel sort of troubled by this idea that sex should be de- detached from other humans and that we shouldn't be thinking mm. about the feelings of people that we're engaging in sex acts with. And I think that's a big message in pornography is that sex is just bodies, like it's mm. not people. And hmm. that's not true. And I mean, even it's not like I'm saying that people shouldn't have casual sex, that they only need to be in like love relationships. That's not been, you know, my history even at all. But I sort of, I guess. But you want to bring some humanity back into our conception of, of sexual And love. empathy. Yeah. Hmm. And concern about respect and concern about the other person's feelings and, and dignity and yeah, humanity and and I don't want to glorify this sort of like juvenile idea of like, mm. just like fucking all the time, whoever, like just, you know, like one night stands all the time is really great and fulfilling and satisfying because it's actually not like, and that's, a, that's a position that I had when I was younger, mm-hmm. when I was sort of trying to fake, I guess, sort of fake you know, like find empowerment or confidence in this warped way where it's like, oh, well, if if I act like these guys who are the players or whatever, who are going around hooking up with girls all the time, if I do the same thing as them, then I'm not vulnerable and I have power and I'm I'm just like them. And yeah, I don't Mm. care. I don't want a relationship. I don't want to, you know, like, I just want to do what I want and have fun and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, first of all, that's not a satisfying experience for most one night stands aren't aren't physically satisfying for most women and I think that we should be able to admit to that but I I do think in general I mean obviously long-term deeper relationships among humans are going to be more satisfying and more fulfilling than just like hooking up with somebody for one night that you don't care about or think about I mean Mm -hmm. why is that I guess I just don't get why that's a good thing to you know, and not think about other people or care about other people. Yeah, I think that this this explanation of, of why um, you're anti-porn or, or porn skeptical, um, that, that that whole empathetic aspect, it, it even goes back and that informs like your desire for nuance within the Me Too movement. Like, how do we have empathy for this person who made a mistake? How do we inject empathy back into all these areas of culture, especially within the dynamics between male, male and uh, female, men and women? Um, that that feels like a like a glowing, warm, guiding light that you have uh, there that that you y- use operatively in a lot of a lot of your work. Um, I, I didn't mean to praise you or anything. I was just uh, just thinking about why you don't annoy me as a feminist when I've been. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what a compliment. I will take that compliment. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's tough because it's just it's not a black and white position. And I think mm. people want me or people in general to have a black and white position. Because so usually, like I said, when I when I write critically or speak critically about porn, they're like, so you want to ban all porn? How are you going to do that? And I'm mm. like, well, I don't. 
I'm not, I've never said I want to ban porn. Like, I don't have an easy solution for this problem. I really don't. Like, I wish that I did, and maybe I will someday, and I'll keep thinking about it. But for now, it's, like, a more <laughs> complicated, like, relationship-based, like, it's hmm. it's a conversation more than anything. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess in a, in a certain respect, that's what you're saying is that uh, the, there's just not this conversation happening. So that so much so, this conversation's so lacking that when anybody, like, questions, they automatically are assumed to be against or want to be, like, completely anti when you're not even doing that. You just want to start to have a conversation about this. Yeah. And I mean, I am anti-porn. I think porn is awful. <laughs> but and I wish that it didn't exist again. Every type not... of porn. I mean, if there was if you're there OK was... with romance novels, which I've is never read porn. a romance novel in my life. So oh, really? I don't even know. Okay, so you're not well, even I don't okay. read that shit. Huh. So you're I mean, I don't even too. read fiction, to be honest. But <laughs> <laughs> I huh. I mean, it's not like I want to ban nudity on screen. Well, desire, or sex scenes. erotic, yeah, erotica. I mean, I don't, I don't think erotica is pornography, but I, I mean, it's just when people say, "Well, all porn," it's like, okay, well, let's talk about most porn that most men watch. Let's hmm. just say that. Okay. I'm sure, there's some like niche porn that isn't awful, but most porn <laughs> that most men are watching on like Pornhub is pretty much kind of all the same. Can we get, can we get a, a Megan uh, porn rating, uh, empathetic porn scale for you? Can you just like watch like 200 hours of porn and tell us like, I think what's well, a five star and what's a zero star? I would be star? so messed up if I watched 200 <laughs> hours of porn and I would probably never want to have sex ever again. But I think like I would probably hate most of it. Okay. I don't think that there's going to be a lot of porn online that I'm going to be like, yeah, this is totally positive <laughs> and also necessary and people really should be watching this. Because I don't even believe, I'm sort of like, why? Like, why do we even need porn? Like, mm. people can have sex without porn. Like, God, like, people, have, I think people have better sex without porn. But, mm. like, what do, you, what do we need porn for? Like, I, I understand that men like it, but I mean, that's not the same as really needing something. It's like, well, just like, I don't know, just like go jack off in the shower. I mean, I know that you guys do that, too, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope you never like just walk around any given apartment with a black light. Um, just just remain in your 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 naivete. I'm not naive. I'm, I'm not kidding. Naive I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm like, it's not, I'm like much less naive than I think most. I think that, okay. I think that I'm much less naive than many feminists. And I think that hmm. like I hang out with a lot of men and yeah. I have a lot of male friends and I have honest conversations with men and I've had a lot of boyfriends and I'm not delusional about how those men behave and function. <laughs> and I'm not saying that all feminists are delusional or naive no. or whatever, but no. I do think that I'm well aware of what men do and how <laughs> they behave. And that, and that in a lot of those cases, I am critical of some things that those men do and have arguments with them about these things, but also know that they're not bad, horrible men. Yeah. The ones that I'm friends with. I mean, I wouldn't be friends with them if I thought they were bad, horrible people. Yeah. So that's where I think that nuance comes in where I'm not totally ready to just dismiss all men who watch porn as bad. Like that's yeah. the other thing that, you know, like I, I feel like sometimes I'm challenged on is it's like, you know, some, some women do argue like, well, stay away from porn users, don't have anything to do with them, cut them out of your life, like they're shitty. And it's like, well, uh, that's not true. I mean, most men do watch porn and, you know, mm. most men that I know, not all of them, I know men who've stopped watching porn because they mm. they recognize the negative impact that it was having on them um, and on their relationships. But I also know men who have continued to watch porn and they're not necessarily, they're not, you know, bad people. Hmm. Like men today have really been brought up on pornography and it's really a habit that I think that a lot of them don't even think about. So it's just, it's too simplistic to say yeah. these are all bad people and we should write them off. 
So I guess that's sort of the same argument that I'm making a little bit around me too. It's like yeah. we can't just we cannot just dismiss people as all bad or all good. That's just yeah. that's not how things work. Yeah. Um, to go back to something interesting that you said about the the man hating version of feminism is just so boring. Like that's the word that you use. That's like a perfectly powerful. That's a very powerful word. It's just boring. It's not like irate or evil or well, if it seems insincere like the boring part i'm gonna can i just stop you for a sec because i just realized my laptop isn't plugged in and i have to plug it in because it's gonna die okay yeah like i think and i don't want to i don't want to say like you know in terms of this man man hating thing it's like i don't want to i'm not talking about necessarily women who have anger at men okay because yeah. i think a lot of women who have anger at men like it's justified but I guess the sort of performative, the performative man hating or the performative dismissals of men and just like stop talking and and, and I mean I guess like the the stop talking thing I don't like because I think everybody should be able to participate in conversations um, and because I. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, 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 men already, <laughs> men are already so bad at communicating. I don't <laughs> want to make them any worse. <laughs> like, all I do is try to force my boyfriends to talk to me and I'm going to tell them to shut up. Like, no, like, say something. Tell me how you feel. Like, this is like drives me crazy. Every relationship I've ever had with a man is me trying to force them to have conversations with me and like process with me and them being like, <laughs> but you're attracted. If that's every relationship, then you're definitely attracted to something. About... Or is it just that all men can't communicate? Well, I'm sure that the, I'm sure the man that communicates probably annoys the fuck out of you. You're like, this is like dating myself. Shut up. I want to, I want to wrench this stuff out of you. This is the fun part. Like I want to get it out. I don't know. I hope that's not true. I mean, I would hate to date myself, but I'm sure that would be very irritating. But the the idea that I specifically like like men who can't communicate is very troubling to me. <laughs> I'm sure I'm ready to acknowledge if that's true. Well, I mean, I'm it's sure that I'm sure frustrating, and it destroys all my relationships. Me being like, hmm. we have to talk about this right now, and why won't you talk about this with me? And why can't you tell me how you feel? And like. Why are you acting like this? And it's like, uh, I just why, why do you need sleep, that from? Leave me alone. Why? Why do you need I that like, from? I like talking. Like I want to have like an hmm. open, honest relationship where well, we're isn't like. Isn't that what girlfriends are for? Well, I have girlfriends also, but like if you're in a relationship with a man, like hopefully, hmm. or whatever, if you're in an in intimate relationship with anybody, hopefully you guys are friends. So it's like. Hmm. You know, like, I want that person to be my friend, like, not <laughs> just my friend, but my friend. And you want to be able to talk to them about stuff hmm. and kind of, like, be close. Like, I I'll obviously I have different relationships with my friends than I do with my hmm. boyfriends. But if something's, like, troubling me or upsetting me about the relationship, I want to be able to talk to my partner about it. But is it and, happening and all the so time? Weird. Is there I'm always like trouble? Is it... I know what you think. You just think I'm mad no. all the time and harassing no. boyfriends. I don't think so. I think I think you genuinely love dudes. I think you genu genuinely I I really get off <laughs> on men. Like that's what turns you on, gets you off, <laughs> and and that's why you're so successful. Um, but I just wonder if, like, you're not demanding a little bit too much from these guys, you know? Like, like if you study male communication, like, do we want to talk about ourselves? Do we want to do something coincidentally, right? Like, let's do something together. But you, you like, that face-to-face -face thing, like, most men are like, let's divert it at, like, a third object or objectify something and fix it. I hope that my boyfriend watches this and this functions in some sort of, like, couples counseling for us. <laughs>
here I am. I think that you're probably right, and I think that he would probably be like, yeah, exactly. Let's do something else. Let's just have a nice time. Like, stop ruining our nice time <laughs> with all of your like. I want to talk about this thing that I'm pissed about. He's like, well, I'm just we saying. We see each other once a week. Let's just have a nice okay. time. Okay. All right. Yeah. If you guys are a LDR, long distance relationship, I understand. I'm just saying. You said all the time, like you always want to be talking. Totally like the, codependent. It it just seems like you might be, you might benefit from just like easing off a little bit and say, you know what, we don't have to do this all the time. Like quarterly, every three months, I'm going to have an issue or like three once a months? month. Okay. okay. I thought like not all the time. I'm like, okay, once a month. <laughs> You know, there's I'll that every three months. You know what? I'll tell you what. I'll try to not bring up anything, any of my issues that I'm having with our relationship and our communication for three months. <laughs> I bet like he'll be really happy about that. I mean, I think that as far as people go, I like to talk more than other people. Like I like to process and I like to like, mm. you know, really get into it like with my friends and with everyone. And I don't and I feel comfortable talking about anything too. like there's nothing that I don't want to have a conversation about. So maybe mm. most people aren't like that. But for some reason, men, maybe you can explain why men don't like that. Like men don't, they don't want to like, talk. They don't want to process all the mm. time. They don't enjoy it. And if something's difficult, like if something's sort of like uncomfortable or stressful or difficult as far as a conversation, I feel like a lot of men are just like, no, I just, I don't want to deal with it. I want to push it away and pretend that it's not there. Hmm. Or maybe just the men that I date. I don't know. There I might guess... be something, since we're since we're just uh, stereotyping men. Yeah, exactly. I'm just going to throw an, out an idea. Maybe I'll get in trouble with this and maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe there's a great I feel like truth, this but... whole video is going to get me in trouble. Good. This is what we do. <laughs> Megan Murphy in trouble. Getting in trouble with Megan Murphy. Um, it might be the case that men um, have learned um, through socialization or through life experiences that it, it doesn't pay to be incompetent at something. Um, it only ever pays off to be an expert in something. So you focus all your energy at uh, being an expert at one thing, right? Mm. Uh, like a career or like, you know, like a engine or just some some way of thinking fixing and it might things, be the case hammering what? things yeah fixing building like stuff one mode of things. being in the world yeah being in the world yeah in a, in a way punching stuff and it might be the case that that in order to be an expert at at communicating emotions and at processing things it, it it's so it's such a steep learning curve um, that they 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 will need years to be able to do it competently. So they'd rather not be they'd rather be completely incompetent than half ass it. So it might be like like a good thing that these men like I I wouldn't even I wouldn't even live up to your expectations if I did do this. So I, I'm not even going to enter into this thing. I'm just thinking. maybe. I mean, at a certain point, they're going to have to try. I mean, I'm approaching forty, so the men I'm dating are at a certain point where they. They should really try to work on communication. Maybe they should all go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm in therapy talking about my boyfriends and why they can't communicate. I don't know how far I'm going to get with this. Being like, like, so long as they're not participating or doing it. I just, I don't, I don't know what you need from them. Just honest, open communication, respectful communication, like, like hearing me hearing like all if the I, time though. like if i'm all, all just listening to me all the time no i'm joking it can go both ways you're not joking <laughs> i am joking I'm okay really joking. but like sort of understanding where i'm coming from and mm. why i'm feeling a certain way mm. and why i want my boyfriends to also try to make plans so that i'm not the only one making plans all the time okay do you want shared labor shared labor shared emotional labor shared emotional labor I get that a some lot. Some effort. Some effort. Yeah. I don't You're know, always going to be disappointed. I know. Well, know I'm that. not. I'm never happy, no matter what, in any relationship. <laughs> so that's just something I also have to. But you, you're such a great remember. communicator that even Twitter wanted to break up with you. <laughs> that's mean. <laughs> that's like, that was a you're joke. You're essentially was... comparing Twitter to my boyfriends and saying that they want to break up with me. <laughs> No, no, I'm just saying, oh, I didn't mean to say like, that. Oh, I hope not. That came out wrong. <laughs> that came out wrong. 
Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was just too good of a communicator for Twitter to handle. No, I guess okay, this is what I'm going to say. We, we should wrap up. I have to I have to go. But you are an excellent communicator. You have a lot to say. Thank you. Don't 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 put that burden of listening on on a single individual when you have the whole Internet. To listen okay, to you feel defensive of my boyfriend. No, I'm just I'm just saying like like if you give him a little bit more space, he'll he'll yeah. give you more. Just like you're a powerful communicator, Megan Murphy. <laughs> you have the whole world. I feel like maybe we should do this once a week. Just <laughs> Actually, to help me <laughs> process my relationships with men. Okay, well, All right. I don't know how this conversation is going to go for everyone watching, but I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, like, man. What are you guys even talking about? I think we got into something. <laughs> you just like chatting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is all that right. all? Do you have any more hard hitting questions for me? Um, I, I think I that we should. My boyfriend's away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish your boyfriend luck and. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we should grab a drink sometime. I should head up to Vancouver. <laughs> or if you're ever headed down to Seattle, let me know. We could do a meetup. Yeah, for sure. That would be fun. It would be fun. Okay. That's it. Let's talk soon. All right, Megan. Good luck <laughs> with the care. suit. Keep me posted. Thank you. I will. All right. Okay. Ciao. Bye.